<laughs> so we want to hear a little bit more. So Claudia, I know she's written also a book, I forgot to say that, about how women lead in Brussels. And in Brussels, you have you know, a lot of powerful people from the European Union, many headquarters of many companies. And um, so I wanted to hear, I mean, you come from Portugal originally, mm. and please share uh, with us something about your journey and your career, your calling, what made you start what you're doing and how has your journey been? Absolutely, thank you. I was thinking about it uh, just uh, coming yesterday, flying in, and I was thinking about the questions you, we have had uh, throughout our last exchange. And um, I realized a few things as well. Uh, I realized that anger has been a driver throughout my entire life. Huh. I'm Portuguese, but I was born uh, in 71, and so it was still a dictatorship in my country. Mm. And it still had colonies, that horrible thing. And I was born in one of those former colonies, which is a small, tiny island in the south of Pacific, which is called East Timor, Timor-Leste, where there was a mm. genocide. So my early childhood has been marked intensively by the notion of suffering, genocide, and how much throughout conflict and situations where people lose totally their rights, fundamental freedoms and rights, um, women are the first victims. They are also the first actors in the front line. They are also the change makers that will reconstruct the countries, negotiate the peace deals. But they are also those that need, we need to support more with mm -hmm. children, of course. And so I think I was very, very young when I was already <laughs> quite aware that I wanted to change the world. I didn't know how. Uh, but I guess I was just very purpose-driven. Uh, and so I think for me it's about a lot of peace. It's mm -hmm. about defining your purpose. What is that you want to do? I just knew that I wanted to change the world. So what does that mean, actually? What, what does that mean that is realistic for a human being? And therefore, I wanted to act at some stage. I just wanted to have more people that were... Um, courageous, ethical, that had um, values that would reflect f those that I share about democratic principles, justice, mm -hmm. respecting um, uh, freedoms. And therefore, building on that, I arrived to Brussels. And um, it was a bit uh, something that should have happened just for six months, because the weather in Brussels sucks. Uh, <laughs> And I ended up staying there for 20 years because it's a city where there's so much opportunity, there's so much power, and therefore, if you want to change the world, you need to be close to those that take the decisions, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that was um, a very clear thing that, um, that I had on my mind. It's interesting that you mentioned that she also had anger, you said, inside. Mm. Sometimes you think, you know, there is the current approach, I'm very inspired. But the truth is that, m or for many people, it's also this sense of injustice or something not being fair. And so, and you experienced that already when you were a little girl, you said. Mm. And share a bit more about that. You know, what are the drivers? Because you are obviously on a mission. I am, I am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I have reconverted my, my, my life through multiple um, stages. My background is in international relations. I'm a political scientist, so that's how I thought I was going to change the world as a diplomat. Then I realized I was not ready to make certain compromises, so I realized I was more the activist. But then I was with the activists for a while, and I realized that mm, I wanted to sit at the table where decision makes <laughs> decision is being made, so I need to get to the top of something. So there was one speaker that said that she had studied law because that was, that's what gave her credibility. <laughs> In my case, it was to go through jobs that gave me very high um, visibility as director. I was working with George Soros, and working in more than 40 countries around the world and the, with the UN in the past, we were just discussing that, um, with the Club of Madrid, working with prime ministers and presidents, and so that gave me the clout that I needed to have access to those that make decisions. 
And then I opened my own company so that I could influence them on how to be inclusive leaders, on how to take women to the top, on how to include diversity and inclusion throughout their organizations and in their teams. And therefore, this has been, I usually define myself as a bridge maker mm -hmm. and a seed planter. I think this, are, this is basically Wonderful. what would define me. Yeah. I create bridges between different sectors. I talk with the politicians. I talk with the private sector. Like, we just had a very difficult win in Brussels, and Anna is there. She's a friend for quite a while and an ally. Um, it took us 10 years to approve a directive that is now currently being... Um, made, converted into reality, which is the European Women on Boards yeah. Directive. So we have, uh, at the moment, 57 of the talent pool coming out of the European Union's universities are women. And then when we look at the pyramid at the top, we had 95% that are male. Okay, so, and this throughout the last decade, so it's not just a very recent thing. We had 10 years ago, we were already at 61% of the talent pool being female. So where was this talent going? Yeah. My belief and the reason why uh, I am indeed in a mission is because I think that putting more women at the top will create an effect that will trickle down yeah. Through the, throughout the organizations, throughout the society. For example, I care a lot ab about another P, so besides purpose, besides passion, I care, and people, and I care for the planet, yeah. okay? And I, I worry with so many trends uh, at the moment, and we're already too late, <laughs> almost. Mm -hmm. So we need to act yesterday, mm -hmm. right? And we see that when we have more women in decision-making, we have companies performing more sustainably. We mm. see that we have um, um, more, less carbon footprint from the different uh, areas of production they have, et cetera, et cetera. So the connection is already there. So that's why I've been training, teaching, advising, lecturing, <laughs> writing <laughs> books, <laughs> you name it, uh, with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, including many, many men. I have my network of what I call my men ambassadors. Mm -hmm. So my men ambassadors are basically the people that want to use their privilege to open the doors for those that had not that unearned um, advantage in life. Like I am opening, I'm trying to use my own privilege, and here goes another P, right? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Using my own privilege as a white woman to open the doors for the, wom the women that are less represented, in this case in decision making, in the European Union, in the different sectors, yeah. uh, politics, private, academia, think tanks, you name it. Wow. You also mentioned that going into politics directly yourself had, would involve certain compromises. And other things you told me before too uh, makes me understand you are also in this journey of integrity. Mm. And we know that um, standing up for something and standing for something um, isn't always easy either because a lot of people have a lot of views and opinions about that. And you may also ruin certain things that were done in a certain way before. So tell us a little bit about that risk-taking you probably must have had taken, oh. stepping out of the comfort zone, and also standing in your power, even if it wasn't popular. Mm. I realize that we always have more power and more privileges than we actually think we have. Mm. And we actually have more courage than we think we have until the moment comes. And we know that we act when either the situation where we are is no longer tenable or the carrot for what we want to attain is so big that it drives our energy towards that. So in my case, I have been led by that those two forces. I was in a periphery country, mm. small southern European, no, <laughs> no political power. I was not going to go anywhere there. Yeah. 
And I'm also very ambitious. And so I wanted to make a change. I didn't know how. My family was not going to support me. I didn't know how. So I basically talked with everybody I could find throughout university. I basically registered for all the scholarships possible that I could find. And then when I finally had one reply, I went for it because the appeal, the carrot, was so big just to find a place where there would be more oxygen yeah. for me to grow, for me to learn. And I think this is one of the big drivers, is yeah. the learning, the constant learning. And we are in such a world that if we're not always questioning ourselves in what we know, what else is out there? How can we solve the problems with a different level of thinking, with complementary mindsets. That's why I, I've been with the year so invested in working on inclusive leadership. Mm. Because today's world's challenges are so big that we cannot solve them just as small groups in little silos. We really need people from all the generations. We need, we have five generations in the workplace. They have radically different needs, expectations, ways of working. Mm -hmm. We need to bring the best of each of these generations to, to create the solutions, the new solutions yeah. that are needed. So as a last question to you, um, in this weird time we are living in, accelerated change, technology, uncertainty, mm. and, and you name it, what type of leadership is, in your view, required right now? leadership of yourself and that of others and projects and yeah. It definitely starts with ourselves. Yeah. It definitely starts with awareness, self-awareness, awareness yeah. of the people you have around you, yeah. of the world you live in. So and then this an awareness of the interconnection between everything and everything. You cannot talk about politics today without thinking in terms of demographic transformations, yeah. for example. We cannot talk about economy at the moment without thinking in terms of security, geopolitical uh, transformations, yeah. megatrends. How is, how is climate change? How is climate change already affecting the way we work, the way we live, our, the way our societies are going to be functioning yeah. in the coming decade? Yeah. Right? So the type of leader needs to be able to ask these questions, surround himself or herself with people that bring different perspectives from all intersectional mm. backgrounds, and to have this, the mindset that will be um, humble enough to realize our own limits. We live, I think, in, a, in um, we, we live in a world with, with, with social media, etc., where we're always trying to project big egos. It's very, it's very. Um, our brands are usually very shiny, very flashy, very perfect, very powerful, very everything. And when we think of the the type of organizations and the type of institutions and society that we we need to cope with what's happening and the transformations that we're seeing and the polarization that we're seeing and the lack of trust that we're mm -hmm. seeing, we need people that can collaborate horizontally. So this means necessarily less ego. So this means that it always starts by each of us to check our own ego. Yeah. And that's a full-time <laughs> job, even for those of us who have been working on this and themselves <laughs> for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And then it's about putting together the strategy, the, the different um, uh, wisdoms, knowledges, uh, areas. You, we cannot know it all. The world became so complex that it's impossible for each of us to understand it all. So we, it's about being humble as well and say, I'm the leader here. You are my team. I don't have the answers. No one has. But maybe you have a little bit of that answer you have another bit, you have another bit, and by working together, we can solve this problem. Thank you.
It's my hope. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I continue doing it. I think it's brilliant, and I also <laughs> encourage you to everybody to keep learning of all different fields. We are Renaissance women and Renaissance men. Mm. Is this and that? We can be interested in everything because exactly those mm. are the skills of the future. Mm. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you, Christine. And there's a f maybe if there's two words in which I would like to leave is the world has so many emotions right now more than ever, we are seeing such a restlessness at so many levels that if we can start by those of us, that every act that we place out there, that we put out there in the world is a, an act that builds trust, yeah. that creates a bridge. Even at micro levels, small actions matter. It's transforming the world, the planet, the society, one person at a time. It's one seed at a time, uh, really. So if we do that, I think we can make that change. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> we give you a warm applause. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.